Hosa, oh, let's get back over here. We want people at home to be able to see what a pretty girl you are. Uh, <laughs> Posa is, uh, is a testament to breed. She's a border collie now. She's very, very smart. Uh, now, this is her roadmap to success. Um, I think in her case, I think the Guardians do an outstanding job of getting her exercise, but they could uh, start an exercise journal. And remember, when she starts getting, bringing toys or kind of bounding around the room a little bit or starts checking out the windows, we might want to take her out and play a little bit of fetch. Keep an exercise journal for a week or two and just write down the times that you exercise. We went for a five-mile run in the at this time in the morning. Uh, you guys know about distended stomachs, right? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't run a dog with a full stomach, especially right. a lot of lateral movement. Yeah. Um, so basically write down what time you actually, uh, the time and how long you ran for, and then came back home and then maybe put feeding and then the times that she gets excited or gets into trouble. And then again, when she does those things, that should be your indicator. She should be communicating. You should interpret as her communicating. I need some more exercise. So take her outside for a little game of fetch. I also mentioned that the guardians might want to do a little bit of scent games. You can just Google scent games. There's a whole bunch of games out there, um, but hiding treats or hiding a specific object can make the dog work for it. Uh, for Border Collie, especially a really intelligent Border Collie like Posa, um, you want to mentally stimulate them as well. So coming up with some scent games where she's got to find some things, uh, games that are going to cause her to uh, use her brain a little bit and problem solve are going to be really beneficial. One of the things they do that's really good is they feed her out of a, uh, a treat dispensing toy at times, which is another great thing to do. Posa. Come. Now she has a tendency to get fixated on things. Like I just, her pupils just went uh, So she's really into fetching things. So pulling out these things and not always playing fetch over and over again, you see how she's just ready to, she's in that hyper alert mode. Well, just having it and not letting her go after it can be a lesson in self-control. Uh, now I can put it here and kind of claim it. Now we, one of the things we went over was a leave it exercise. Uh, which I have here and I'll talk about the instructions for that here in a second, but teaching her uh, impulse control. You can't eat your dinner until I give you the release command. You have to sit at the door before you can go outside. When we're playing fetch, try to incorporate little breaks. If she brings the ball back and she's all ready to go, I mean, I make my dog sit and then I'll like pull up, I'll go like this, but I won't throw it. And she starts taking off and now she's got, to, she realizes she has to come back and sit. And I incorporate longer and longer breaks for her so that she learns and posts the same thing. So she learns, I can't just get it over and over again. It's not healthy for her to be in that manic state that she gets into, that a lot of border collies get into. They have a hyper focus and usually it works against us. It's one of the reasons I went over a focus exercise, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, but uh, I like to flip the leader follower dynamic by incorporating rules and structure. And so one of the things that I did was uh, we talked about different rules. One of the rules would be not being allowed in the furniture for at least 30 days or as long as the problem is still going on. And at that point, furniture with an invitation per occurrence and only for good behavior. Um, to get her off the couch, what I usually do is just take a treat like this and I just toss it about three feet off of the, off of the couch. When she gets down to get it, I say the word off. Um, or down, whatever word the preference of the guardians is. Make sure anytime you're giving a treat, the treat should go in the mouth first and the dog should hear the command word immediately after. That creates a more of a positive association. Um, let me see, what else? Um, other rules, you have to sit in the door before you go in or out. And if I tell you to sit once, you don't sit within three seconds, I walk away, sit down, watch TV, do something for one minute, then go back to the door and can't command her again, sit. She doesn't sit, then I walk away from the door this time for two minutes. I come back and I say, sit. I'm, she's off camera. I wanted to see if she would, but she's looking at her guardian wanting to play fetch and he's doing a job of ignoring her. Just because she wants to do something doesn't mean we want to do it for her. It's not being mean, but it's teaching the dog impulse control. Now, if he does want to throw it, he can maybe tell her to SIT or do something like that. And then when she complies, then he does it for her. This is a great way to train your dog without using treats by putting something the dog wants to do after it does something for you to earn it. Uh, let me see. So other, uh, so I do that eventually with both dogs, uh, with both doors. We might temporarily close the dog door for periods of day to practice this because we have a dog door in this house. Um, when the humans are eating, the dog should not be within seven feet of the humans. When the humans are preparing food in the kitchen, they should not be within seven feet or shouldn't be in the kitchen at all. Um, I would recommend that we bring the dog bed, which we have kind of two joined rooms here, but the dog bed is on the far side of the second room. I would recommend we bring the dog bed in here and put it next to the TV so it's kind of more inclusive. To train her to go to the dog bed on command, she probably won't take very much for her because she's so smart, but you just toss a treat on it and say beach or maybe uh, Cuba or whatever the word is that you want to assign for the uh, dog bed. And if we have different dog beds in the house, each dog bed should have its own designation. 
Um, I also went over uh, passive training, and passive training is rewarding the dog when it, when it offers desired actions and behaviors. Every time the dog comes to you on its own, pet it and say come. Every time the dog sits down next to you, pet it and say sit. Uh, lays down, pet it and say down. Try to pet it whenever possible under the chin to facilitate that nose up orientation that's a good proud body mechanic dogs have. Um, and avoid patting a dog on top of the head. We can scratch and we can caress, but we don't want to pat. Um, and if the head, dog's butt is here, his head is here, I can scratch the butt. I just don't ever want to pat on top of the head. Um, so passive training by, by, show, by spotlighting and recognizing the dog, every time it offers these desired behaviors, it will, continue, it will start offering them more and more often as a way to get your attention. Now right now, she will jump up and kind of cuddle next to her guardians. And I think that they were inadvertently uh, reinforcing some of these insecurities because they were petting her at times when she was insecure, which is a very common thing that most humans do. It works great for humans, it backfires on dogs. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're reinforcing and enhancing. If your dog is fearful and you pet it to try to placate it and soothe it, you're gonna make it slightly more nervous or scared or anxious or even excited. A lot of us confuse excited for happy. But every time it comes home and the dog is bouncing around, we pet it, we're making it slightly more excited the next time that happens. After a while, they get so excited that they can't control themselves or they can make a mistake. Just like us, if I have to do something very, uh, uh, it takes a lot of concentration, I'm not gonna do it when I'm stressing about something else. I wanna clear my head, meditate, whatever I need to do, and come to it calm and balanced and focused. Um, so uh, the other thing I went over, uh, like I said, or what I was going over is uh, petting with a purpose, which is if the dog comes and nudges me or scratches at me or barks at me or whatever it is, puts her chin on, looks up really cute, it's cute, but she's still asking for attention. If I pet her with no reason, that's something that only happens to leader dogs. And that can confuse her into thinking she has more uh, authority than she actually does. Or if she tells me I want attention and I give it to her, then that tells her that she has dominion over the human. So the Guardian's doing a great job because she really wants him to play with right over here off camera with one of her toys and he's just ignoring her. And she's doing everything she can. She's dropping it, picking it up and shaking it around and he's not even looking at her. And even if we look at the dog and we don't, that's an acknowledgement and that dog is trying to get your attention. So if the dog, but going back to petting with a purpose, the dog comes over and nudges me and I pet it, I'm telling the dog, yes, you can tell me what to do. So in future, when the dog nudges me or scratches at me or does any of these things, I give it a counter order, tell it to sit. When it sits, I pet it under its chin and I say the word sit, and then I can pet it for an hour after that. Um, if it's already sitting, I might ask it to come and sit over here or to lie down. It just has to do something to change its state, and it's essentially paying for the privilege of having me pet it. And that will help the dog with its self-esteem and confidence because it felt like it earned that attention. It also helps uh, very subtly redefine the leader-follower dynamic. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, burning energy matters. I went over the escalating consequences that I use, uh, and I'm not going to go through those because the guardians have it on tape. Uh, if you want to grab a seat since we don't have a dog Sorry. in there, no, it's okay. I, I talk a lot. She's standing, trying to do a really good job of holding the camera. It's easier sometimes if you put your, knee, your uh, elbows on your knees. There we go. And so, um, uh, basically, uh, what was I just saying? Escalating, Escalating consequences. I'm not going to go through them, but, they, uh, but the, uh, she responded really well to them. But that's burning energy. If you don't stand up, if you correct the dog and you just keep on repeating the command, the more you re repeat it, the less you mean it. So I recommend that the guardians use the word uh, uh, rerun or uh, repeat or re uh, rerun or something like that. That means you're saying the command multi more than once. Actually, I have several watch words. We'll go through them all at once. Paycheck means I think you're petting the dog without a purpose. So if the dog comes up and nudges me and I pet it while it's standing, it's telling me what to do. So if the guardian come, another guardian comes in and my partner says, hey, you're petting the dog without a purpose, I'm like, oh, I stop petting, tell, tell the dog to sit, pet it on his chin, say sit. And then I say, actually, I asked the dog to sit before he came in. When, when you heard you close the bathroom door, he stood up and I continued petting him, or her in this case. And so uh, we can pet the dog as much as we want. The dog has just to either prepay for it or do something to change its state to earn that affection or pay for our attention. Petting with a purpose and passive training are the two easiest things that guardians can do that are going to have the biggest, most profound impact on the dog because it just is, it works through a lot of repetition, but it takes about a month to get into the habit of doing it. Um, let me see, so uh, she is being very determined with uh, the toy that she wants to play with. And uh, so again, if she wants to do this, if we are inclined, if she's doing this, she's kind of telling us we need some attention. So we might maybe play a little game, a focus game or a targeting game or something like that a couple times, then go out. So she has to do a little bit of work, then we go out and play. But again, when she does these sort of things, she's telling me, I have too much energy, you waited too long to exercise me. And again, these guardians are doing a great job of doing it, but she's a border collie, they need a lot of mental and physical stimulation. Uh, let me see. Um, okay, so what are the other things we went over? Um, 
uh, uh, two to four, uh, oh, two to four times. Um, I'm rereading my notes. Uh, I gave, told him to give me uh, scratches, and now I have to translate in my own brain because they made sense when I told him. Um, so, okay. So basically what we'd like to do is uh, uh, we have uh, the guardians are going to be getting married, and uh, the dog is going to go stay with uh, one of their uh, relatives, and the relatives are going to the wedding. It's a destination wedding. And so basically this dog is going to go stay with another dog that she likes, but the woman who watches the dog also has two kids. And one of her big problems is she does not like little kids. So I have a whole lot of little tips here that we're going to go over for, that, for this section. So one of the things we'd like to do is um, uh, when you, uh, when the kid is, uh, if, he, if the kid played basketball or whatever, I would get a little hand towel for each kid. Have the dog watcher. Next time the kid is playing basketball or something that's athletic, or even before a shower, take the hand towel and rub it all over that child's body, both sides of the towel. Preferably if they're sweating, but just if you can't, that's fine. Put it in a Ziploc bag and zip it up. And then basically give it to you. And you have one for each child, maybe write it on the marker and just get a Walmart towel so you don't care what it is. What we want to do is take that towel out, put it on the floor, and then drop a treat on it. Let uh, Posa go over and lick it up. So when she licks it up, she's getting a treat, and she's also getting the scent of that particular child. And we want to do that, and then pick maybe one or two treats and pick it up, put it back in the Ziploc bag so it retains the scent. Next time, pull out the next one. And do this all over your house at different parts of the house. Um, and if we go to the house that she's going to be staying at, we would want to bring those over there and practice that there in that setting as well. So that way she starts getting a positive association with the child's scent, but at a very easy uh, level of in, uh, intensity because the child's not actually there. It's just one sense, scent. Next thing we want to do is uh, have the child uh, get, uh, give a big bag of her food to the children and have the mom supervise the kid, take a handful of treats. Dog sh the kid should put it in their hands and rub it between their hands and put it in a Ziploc bag. And then you're going to take that bag back and we're going to start feeding her that about a month before she's going to go stay with them. That way, every time she gets food, she has another positive association with the children's scent and it's scent only. Um, I did this with my puppy when I went to visit him. I, before I had ever met him, he came right up. He knew exactly who I was because dogs meet through scent. So this is a great way to make it very subtle and help her have a positive association. Let me see. Um, next thing I'd like to do is have them, uh, if they can, take Posa. Again, take her to, to fetch first or go for a long run. Bring home, let her ha hang out for half an hour, take a nap. Then go over to the dog uh, sitter's house, not the parent's house. Um, and then basically what they, what they want to do is we'd like to walk together. Now dogs get over things by walking together, but if the kids are overwhelming for her, we want to do this maybe one kid at a time. Now sometimes what we do is what we call parallel walks. So we might actually have Posa with one of her guardians on this side of the street, and on the other side of the street we have one of the children. And then we're walking parallel down the street where we're even. Don't let anybody be in front. Don't let her be in front especially. Um, now, if, she, if, if she's walking, she's comfortable, then the person, the kid on this side of the street can actually start gr coming over, and eventually we'd like to get them walking next to her. Um, they're not going to pet her, they're not going to talk to her, they're not even going to look at her. They need to pretend like she's, she's invisible. The more they try to engage with her, the more she thinks, what are you trying to pull over on me? We want her to practice being around them where they don't do anything with her, and just build up practice of, hey, I like walking, we went for a walk, the kids didn't do anything bad. And there's only one of them at a time. So we want to do this with each kid maybe two to four times sometime before they, we transition. The next transition would be to have them come over to the parent's house and then try to go for one or two walks. Maybe, maybe since it would be inconvenient, have the kids come over and go for a walk around the block with one kid. Then we pick the one kid stops and the other kid joins us on another walk. And then they leave. So again, no talking, no interacting. Does she catch? Uh, yeah. Okay, so if she catches things after the walk, the child can walk about seven feet away, have some of these high value training treats, and just, and you tell her to sit, and when she sits, have her throw the treat at her. If it, if it just bounces her nose and she didn't get it and they pick it up, that's fine. But this way, this is another way to interact with the dog, but at a distance so the dog feels comfortable. Um, the next stage would be uh, to have them come over to your parents' house, uh, your parents' house, excuse me, and then play fetch with the dog. Now, if we have like a, uh, an area uh, we'd like, she has some leash aggression. Dogs have a fight or flight response. A lot of times we lead them towards things that we're not gonna actually go towards the, uh, interact with the object, but the dog's mind, you're leading me towards it, and so I start freaking out. Dogs have a fight or flight response. If I can't run away from it, my next step is to growl and try to make it move away. 
So some dogs are a lot better off leash. So by the time that we actually do this off leash, we've already set her up for success by introducing the scent, putting the scent on the food, going for walks, and then eventually doing the treat toss. Now we go to the place where she's gonna be staying. Now what we like to do is go out there and again, exercise her before we do all these things, give her a recovery period so we take off that edge. Then what we like to do is have the kid throwing the ball for the dog. And they're not gonna tell her to do anything, the guardian who would be there would give the dog all the commands, but dog, she really likes to fetch, and this is a nice way to interact with the child where we don't have to worry about that she can move away because she doesn't want to, some dogs will lunge at things, she doesn't, she wants to move away. But if the child picks it up and throws it, great. Uh, and she goes and get it, now she's interacting with the child, again, in something that she likes and building up a different positive association through physical activity. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, for the introduction, again, we should introduce them one at a time and outside of the house, inside, more compact the area, compact the area, the more alert and, and, and the more the dogs can be on alert. So we wanna do this outside and again, associate a walk with it for each one of the kids. And again, trying to do that about two to four visits, gonna really help her feel more comfortable and relaxed and enjoy that, that experience. Uh, let me see. Um, da -da -da -da. Okay, so now we're gonna go over the exercises. We went through a lot of exercises. She's so damn smart. So one of the things we went over was a leave it exercise. I'd like the guardians to see each one of them practice it about two times, each guardian practice it twice a day for a week. Now when you're doing this, this should take maybe a minute, and as you're doing it, it'll take a little bit longer because you're gonna make the dog wait for longer and longer periods of time. But the idea is eventually, I wanna be able to just drop a treat and have the dog sitting or standing wherever it is and doesn't even look and looks at me, and then I pick it up, give it to the dog, and I say, ignore is the word we're using. Um, now the next step would be to actually, once, she, once we've gotten after a week and we, she'll ignore it no matter where we put it, at first we were cupping and then we were just kind of exposing and getting ready to cup, but eventually what we'd like to do is put some treats, a line of treats, and walk her in the house on a leash, and every time she comes up on the treats, we say ignore, she looks up at me, and I give her a treat. After the second time, we do maybe every other treat, she gets the treat. And after the third time, maybe it's at the end of all of them, she gets a treat. But we're teaching her if you leave the treats alone on the ground, there's a benefit or a reward for you. Now, I like to give a lot of treats to begin with, and as we're doing it, once the dog established it knows how to do it, then we wanna start weaning them off the treats, maybe every other time, then every third time. And that should take a week or two to transition, but eventually we want the dog to do it for your attention, and she clearly thrives on thirst for the attention of her guardians. She's now gone to a different toy that she's shaking. She wants to get his attention. Um, okay, the other thing we went over was a targeting exercise, um, which is basically you flash your hand, the dog puts his nose over here, we drop the treat on her hand, she licks it off, and we say the word target. Now, at first we did it, all, it was just right in front of the dog's nose, we just did it right here, and all she had to do is turn her head a little bit. After a while, we flashed over here, and she had to lean over to touch it. We'd like to get her now taking a step to do it, and then two steps and three steps. And the great thing about this is you can actually move your dog around and have them target your hand, and you can have them move from this direction to that direction. You want to play fetch with it? Oh, you want to play tug of war. Tug of war is great, but again, I would make her do something first. Sit. Sit. Uh, does she have a drop command? So to do a drop command, she's got something like this. Hold the treat in front of her nose, drop. I didn't, I'm teaching this one on, during the roadmap. Drop. I'm not trying to take it from her. The more we try to take something from the dog, the more we make it a high value item. I know you like this thing too. So tease a little bit, she takes it, drop. After you do, practice this, this is something to practice periodically, but you want to practice what we call, even though this isn't super low value for her, but this is pretty low value. Now she's a good dog, she doesn't steal sneakers and stuff like that, but a lot of dogs will do that and we chase them. That's a fun game for the dog. It teaches the dog that I know how to get a rise out of you and make you play with me even when you don't want to. So teaching your dog to drop things on command, and I can say take, drop. And so you can come up with the other hand, uh, other side of that coin as well. But teaching her to drop things on her own, especially if she's going to be with the kids, that way that the kid, she, you know, we don't want the kids to try to take something from her or get in near her of that. And then the kid just says drop, she drops, let her take the treat off. Now for kids, I usually like to have the kids offer a treat on a po flat palm of the hand, but this should not happen until we've already gone for walks, we put the scent on the treats, on the toys, on the towel, and start to play fetch at the home, and then we've done the treat toss. Sit, catch. So she does have a catch. So practice that a little bit before you take, before you do a catch. So maybe the human catches, the guardian catches a couple times. Then we have the child does one, and then I go back, I do two, and then the child does one. After a while, the child is exclusively doing it. But by alternating, me do two or three, and the child does one, then I do two, and the child does two. 
we gradually wind it back and forth. Sit, sit. Um, okay, um, let me see. Uh, oh, uh, uh, on the walks. So um, we went over a focus exercise, um, and if you forget how to do that, message me. Um, that's something I'd like the Guardians both to practice about twice a day each. And because she's so fast, normally I would say one second, one second for all 12 treats, uh, and have each person practice a couple times. She's so fast, maybe one second, one second for six treats. And once she's staring at us, which she pretty much is, then we can start adding the increase. Probably like to do maybe one second increase for each different practice session based on her level of intelligence. Try to get to the point where you're 20 seconds in the house and do it in different parts of your house. Well, next step is to go practice outside when there's no distractions outside, but just the outside itself is a distraction. And then, and then we might go back to one second, one second, but you can move a lot faster and get yourself back up to 20 seconds. Then we want to do it outside when there is a dog outside or somebody's mowing their lawn or something else. Um, now, for, she also is, is reactive to certain other sounds, and the video above this shows you how you can use counter conditioning. So make a list of all the sounds that she's reacted to and systematically deprogram her, counter her, condition her so she's no longer reactive to those. Because that uh, height, that fear is going to be related to cortisol in her blood and her reactivity to all sorts of different things. Um, so eventually, we would like to have her practice the focus exercise when somebody has the weed eater going next door. And, or maybe you have somebody else and we have the lead eater in the front and she's filtered that out. After we've done the counter conditioning, we want her to be able to filter it and focus outside of that. And then the next, the last step is to actually go on a walk. And when she's walking and there's no people around, there's no dogs, there's no kids, there's no reason for it. And just every once in a while say focus when she looks up at you and pop in her mouth and say the word focus. So we teach her on the walks to look up at us at various times and it's a great way to read her to her attention. Now the key for these is you have to practice in easy scenarios and then progressively more and more difficult scenarios until you work your way back to the actual real world situation. Don't try to use any of these until you have them mastered in a real world situation. Otherwise it'll backfire and it'll slow down your progress. Now something else I like to do for dogs on walks is a, practice a U-turn. So if I see some kids running out in the yard and it's, I see it, or if the dogs are reactive, if she's reactive to a dog and the dog's off leash, if I see the dog before she does and I turn around, but she recognizes every time he turns around it's because there's a kid or something out, that makes her, the turn makes her look around for it more. So what I do is I build that behavior in. So on a regular walk, when there's nobody walking around, I'm walking this way and I always turn away from the dog. So let's say she is on my right side. So as I'm walking, I would, if the street is, or the side was going this way, when I'm getting ready to turn, I would turn, I would walk and turn sideways. So now I'm perpendicular to the road and I'm holding one treat out in my off hand here. She comes around, uh, so I, let me actually stand up and pan my, you just do it from seated. So while I'm going, I'm walking here, I turn my first one this way, dog is here and I hold it. When she comes around, I take, now I go back the other way, so I take one more step. So she, I'm completely facing the other direction. I pop the treat in her mouth and I say the word turn. Then I take about four to eight steps this way. I may need to just not get dizzy. And I repeat the process, turn. So eventually you're doing a little oval, but you're teaching the dog to turn on command. And this is really helpful. So if you do see something that you know she's gonna be reactive to, you immediately turn and walk the other direction. Now if she is reacting, any dog is reacting to anything, the best thing you can do is increase the distance. And oftentimes we have to get them out of sight. So if you have a built-in U-turn, it's a great plan B. And then you, as you're going backwards, you look for a tree or a car, especially kids skateboarding or coming towards you. You just want to increase the distance so your dog sees, hey, when I communicate that I'm uncomfortable, my human's got my back and they help me move away. I don't have to lunge or bark at them. The human's reading me and helping me move away. And that's a much more desirable behavior for a dog to move away from something they're fearful of than react to it. Uh, now, I went through off camera a list of warning signs, so make sure you recognize those and look for those. Sometimes you might want to actually have somebody walking about 10 feet away in the street or on the other side of the street and walk you by with her, some kids playing in somebody's front yard, so you can actually see your own dog. Sometimes you'll recognize, oh, her tells her, her ears go back, her tail goes up and does this, and her hackles do this and she walks or she stares or whatever these signs are. But recognizing what your dog's warning signs are makes you better equipped to put them in a position to succeed because you can read your dog when it tells you it's uncomfortable. Now the last thing we went over is we did a little counter conditioning in the video above about sounds of objects. Well, you can also do that for the visual of objects. Posa, let's get you over here. I want you here first. And what I'm gonna do is in the same sort of counter conditioning. So what I'd like the guardians to do is find a playground, take these treats and sit as far away from the playground as you want. As you can see, I can turn her wherever I want. So I'd like the playground over there. 
And what I would do is have these high value training treats. Sometimes you can use a bully stick. If she really likes a bully stick, something that take a little bit longer. I like an ingestible item though, preferably. Some people will actually, when they do this, will go to get a piece of roast beef, get it cut about a third of an inch thick, and then cut it in slices. So it's like a push up of meat which sounds gross, but dogs will love it. And so the idea is she's looking at these kids on the playground. Now my two tests for the uh, litmus test for this, can the dog stay seated and then taking the treat? If she gets up or she stops eating the treat, she's saying those kids are too close. And the behavior of the kids is also gonna be an indicator. If you have a kid where it's like little kids and they're just on a seesaw, it's very soft, that's easier for her. If their kids run around, they're really noisy and loud, she might be more reactive. So you might have to move back and forth. But the idea is to move back uh, get as close as you can where you can feed her a treat and get her to stay seated. Those are her, her indicators. Once you find that distance, let's say we're at 50 feet. What I would do there is go there and you're pushing the treat, in, uh, the, you know, the meat popsicle into her mouth. She's chewing on it while she's looking at the kids. And, and then basically you do that for maybe one or two of these sticks and then walk away. And the next time you go to maybe 49 feet and then 48 feet. 47. The idea is to keep on getting progressively closer and closer to the kids until eventually they're just right here and they're ignoring, you know, she's, she's created a positive association. Now, while this is happening, the kids see dog and they walk towards you, immediately get up and walk away. You want to tell the dog that, look, we're not, I'm not going to force you to deal with this. One other thing that we might want to do, she's got a yellow bandana. In the dog behavior world, what we try to tell people to do is if you have a reactive dog or a dog doesn't be well being approached, is to get a big yellow bow and tie it halfway down the leash to make it really big and pronounced. And she's a you know female, so we can say it's a yellow. Uh, but yellow is good as a color because people will say, what's the yellow sign for? Uh, she's, you know, she's a rescue dog or she had surgery or she doesn't do well with strangers or whatever it is. If you tell people, my dog doesn't like being petted by strangers, oh, but dogs love me, let me show, why'd your dog bite me? Because you're an idiot and you didn't listen when I said, please leave my dog alone. That, if you tell them, that, and sometimes I just, little white lies, I think are a little bit more effective. You know, we're training right now. It's an indication that we're training, so we're asking people not to approach because we're teaching her to pay attention to us. Or she had surgery or she, you know, she feels sick or whatever it is. But a lot of times if you say those sort of things, you do it at a distance and people will respect you for it. Uh, training really works because a lot of people understand. Training, oh, okay, I'll walk away. Um, and that's the idea is for her, if he, she sees my humans are making people walk away or the kids walk away or walking me away from things that startle me, I've had more confidence in my humans. She clearly loves her humans, but I think inadvertently they might have confu uh, put her in a jackpot situation occasionally. Now they know better, and so uh, I should see, we should start seeing re really good improvements. Now, um, I'm not sure how she's gonna do with the kids because we don't have any kids here to practice with. And so I want the guardians to practice all the things that we've gone over here, um, I've gone through the list, um, for about a month. Now we have a couple months before the wedding, so we have plenty of time, but if in a month, um, you're not, you're, you know, she, you're having problems with the playground, or if you have any problems at any time, make sure you text me. I, I can only help you if you let me know. If I don't hear from you, I assume that things are going great. So please text me. I want you to text me. Usually I can help with a quick phone call. Sometimes cases like this, we need to make little adjustments each week or every couple of days to get you on the right path. Uh, but we might need to do a follow-up session to do some behavior adjustment training where we actually teach her to move away from the kids and actually work with the kids that she's going to be staying with to create those positive associations. But for right now, uh, I think uh, because she's so smart, I'm guessing, you gonna get that one? Let's try that again. Nope, she's not. Now, if I ask her to get it multiple times, then I'm begging putting her in the driver's seat. Off! Sit. Now, uh, one last little thing, and then I'll do the, my wrap up. Um, one of the things I like to do is give a dog a directional command. So we just went through how to do one off the, off the couch by throwing it on the floor and saying out or off. What I do is for the directional commands is maybe if we want her to stay out of the kitchen. So I take her into the kitchen, I have two treats. Let's say this is the doorway of the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen, this is the hallway. I take the treat like this and just throw it right outside. Out, and she comes back. Out, I would do that with each room in the house. So that way, because when we tell the dog to leave the room, that's actually a punishment for dog to be excluded from the group. And so if we help the dog practice leaving the room for positive reinforcement, then we say out to get out of the kitchen. They run out of the kitchen, they sit at the exit, and they're like, all right, I'm out, where's my payment? Now, eventually we can get to the point where we're just petting her and scratching her for a pet, uh, for a reward as opposed to giving her a treat, but there's nothing wrong with giving treats initially. All right, Posa, that was a great drop. Sit, drop. This is Posa, this is Posa's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.